Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Lionel Barrymore, Anita Louise, and Glenn Ford in A Man to Remember. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. And greetings to the armed forces of the United States all over the world who hear the Lux Radio Theater through shortwave and other special facilities. Tonight, we honor a good and faithful servant. He presides at our entrance into this world and at our exit into the next. He fights our mortal enemy disease. He banishes our pain, brings us rest, and earns a fortune in unpaid bills. He's the hero who has sworn the sacred oath of Hippocrates, that he will lead his life and practice his art in uprightness and honor, that whatsoever house he shall enter, it shall be for the good of the sick to the utmost of his power, and that whatsoever he shall see or hear of the lives of men which is not fitting to be spoken, he will keep inviolably secret. Tonight's play is one of the finest tributes I know to the American family doctor. RKO made the motion picture, and for our production of A Man to Remember this evening, we've selected a cast I'm sure you'll remember. Lionel Barrymore, Anita Louise, and Glenn Ford. Lionel Barrymore has just finished playing another doctor for Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, calling Dr. Gillespie. You know, producing a different play every week, it's something like spending your whole life on an exploring trip. There's a surprise or a thrill around every turn. But no matter how interesting the job may be to us, it isn't really well done unless we can thrill you with these plays which Lux Toilet Soap brings you each Monday night. Never in the history of the theater has any one theater been able to call on so much talent as we can here in Hollywood. It's a producer's dream come true. And the Aladdin's lamp that made it come true was a cake of soap, Lux toilet soap. But no single magician produced that. It took all the magic of modern science. Now, to the doctors of America, we dedicate our play, A Man to Remember, starring Lionel Barrymore as Dr. Abbott, Anita Louise as Jean, and Glenn Ford as Dick. If you should be traveling through the Middle West sometime, you might come upon a little town called Westport. It's just an ordinary small town with its main street, of course, and its first national bank, owned by George Sykes. Homer Ramsey's department store is there, too, and a few other smaller shops. But on this spring afternoon, those that aren't closed are empty, for old Doc Abbott is dead and the townspeople stand along the curb in respectful silence as the funeral procession passes by. Mother, can I sell my flower now? Yes, dear, no. I never saw so many flowers. Never. He deserved it, if any man did. What's going on, bud? I'm a stranger in town. Somebody important die? Old Doc Abbott died. Take off your hat, stranger. Hmm? Oh, sure, sure. On the second floor of the bank building, is the office of Lawyer Perkins. From his window, the three leading businessmen of the town also watch the procession. But they're unmoved, cynical. Hey, look at that crowd down there. I gave the town the only hospital it ever had, the George Sykes Memorial Hospital. But you think Abbott was the only man in this town worth a plug nickel? I put in the first department store in Westport. I suppose that doesn't amount to anything either. Yes, and Joe Harkness here done a few things too. Yes, sir. It was me got the public schools put in, to say nothing of giving the town a newspaper. Yeah, and I'll bet the three of us won't scare up more than a baker's dozen at our funerals. Seems the more shiftless you are, the more people take up with you. Like old Doc Abbott down there. Mr. Sykes, Mr. Ramsey, Mr. Harkness, if you gentlemen can stifle your grief for a moment, perhaps we can get down to work. All right, Counselor. While the town's marching behind the Doc's casket, Let's us figure up the expense. Sit down, gentlemen. I've brought Doc Abbott's strong box with me. I'm sure you're anxious to know what's in it. You'll bet we are. I find that in most cases of this nature, the creditors prefer to wait until, say, 
a half hour after the benediction has been delivered. Now, look here, Perkins. That ain't fair. The doc would want us to have our money. Of course, George. Suppose we get on to business. You first, George. Well, to begin with, I hold Doc Abbott's personal note for $600 plus 100 interest. Hmm, 700 How about you, Homer? I had the bookkeeper figure up his account today. $726.37. He ain't paid a bill at the store since 1928. And you, Jude? He owes me $1,100. I see. Well, gentlemen, Doc Abbott's son gave me this strong box this morning. Suppose we just turn everything out right here on my desk. Gentlemen, the estate. Oh, you get everything upside down doing it that way, Clyde? I guess it doesn't matter. Well, here we have... Looks like one of those notes you were talking about, George. Westport First National Bank, $300 with accumulated interest at 7%. Signed John Abbott, dated May 4th, 1922. Yep, that's the first one, 1922. Yes, just about 20 years ago, wasn't it? I remember it was right after Doc came back to Westport. I guess he needed money pretty badly at the time. So he went to the bank to see his old friend, George Sykes. Morning, George. Well, well, if it ain't John Abbott. That's right. How are you, George? I'm fine, fine. Sit down. It's been a long while since you left here, John. <laughs> For near 25 years. This is my boy, Dick. Well, well, quite a young man. Uh, how old? I'm eight, sir. Eight? Well, well. Uh, this is George Sykes, Dick. We used to go to high school together. That's right. Your father left right after we graduated. He was voted the boy most likely to succeed. Won't you, John? <laughs> <laughs> Seems kind of funny now, doesn't it? Dick, uh, suppose you wait outside for me. I got a little business I want to talk over. Well, sure, Dad. Yes, sir, John. Been a long time. Oh, I heard you lost your wife, John. Too bad. Yeah, she died in Chicago. I couldn't stay there after that, so I came back. You mean to hang out your shingle in Westport, eh? Yeah, as long as I can make a living. Well, we got some doctors here already. But there's a lot of poor folks on the other side of town. You can probably find enough business to get by. Well, I figure to. I'll need a little eating money, though. That's why I came to you. I'd like to make a loan, George. Yeah? How much? Oh, about $300. That's a whale of a lot of money, John. What have you got to offer as security? 17 years' experience as a practicing physician. I've done pretty well. You're broke right now, ain't you? <laughs> that ain't doing so well, John. I meant about keeping my patients alive. That's my business, you know. All right, John. I'll make out a note for $300 and give you 250 Got to have a little bonus, you know, <laughs> when there isn't any security. But I always like to help out an old friend. <laughs> Do you help out many of your old friends this way, George? Oh, you'd be surprised. Uh, you know, George, they should have elected you the boy most likely to succeed. Eh? Huh? Oh, uh, sign right here, John. that note, George? Nary a penny of it. That's why we're here, Perkins, to get what's due us. Well, suppose we just lay this note aside for the present. The next paper here seems to be a bill. It's made out to Howard Johnson, July 17th, 1922. Delivery of child, $25. What's that written on the bottom of it? Seems to be a notation Doc made. Johnson has no money. Well, that was the trouble with Doc. Always treating poor folks who couldn't pay him. Well, I suppose it's pretty hard for a doctor to refuse, Jude. This Johnson now, he was a farmer. He sent for Doc about 2 o'clock one morning. His wife was having a baby. Well, it's all over. You have a fine baby girl, Mrs. Johnson. A girl? I wanted a boy. Somebody who could help me work this farm when I get old. <laughs> Girls are for people who can afford them. How's my wife? Well, I did everything I could, Johnson. I'm afraid she wasn't in very good condition to begin with. And, uh, well, I, I did everything I could. You mean she... There's only one thing I can say. I know how you feel. Because I lost my wife that way. And the baby. Just about a year ago. But uh, uh, keep the baby warm, whatever you do. I'll be back a little later. You get out of here. Get out and don't you never come back. But, man, don't you want to know how to take care of the baby? I said get out, do you hear? Now go on. Go on before I give you more. Get out! Yeah. 
I guess you ain't responsible right now. I'm sorry, man. Another night call, I guess. You get back to bed, son. Well, I'll see who it is first. Hmm. Hey, Dad. Huh? Who is it, son? It ain't anybody. What? It ain't anybody, Dad. There's a basket on the porch. That's all. Basket? <laughs> Look, Dad. It's a little baby. And there's a note pinned on it. What's it say, Dad? Well, let's see, son. Hmm. Dear doctor. I'm sorry I hit you. Please give the kid to somebody who will be good to him. Gee, what are you going to do, Dad? Well, seems like you've got a baby sister, Dick. Let's get her in. Never did hear that story before, Counselor. No, Doc didn't often tell it, Jode, but that's how he came to adopt the girl you all watched grow up and know as Jean Abbott. Well, let's get on with the estate. Seems to be largely bills and more bills, gentlemen. Here's one that ought to look familiar to you, Homer. Homer Ramsey, general merchandise. To Doc Abbott account, one doll, twelve dollars. Yeah. Oh, yes, guess he did buy a doll at the store once. July 17th, 1925. Somebody wrote, please remit across the bill when it was sent. Oh, well, well, that was a mistake. Oh, say, I remember hearing about that. Sure. Seems Doc owed you for that doll, and one morning he walked in the front door with a pig under his arm. Little shoot it was, squealing to beat the van. What's all this about? What's the matter here? Oh, oh, Mr. Ramsey, it's a pig. Uh, I can see that. Is it yours, Doc? Nope. It's yours, Homer. You're crazy. Nope. You see, Homer, you sent me a bill this morning for a doll I bought for my daughter. The bill was marked, please remit. I figured you must be kind of hard up, so I hurried right down. But I can't take a pig in payment. Well, that's the way my patients pay me. Pigs, eggs, potatoes, a... I got this shoat for fixing Mrs. Harkin's liver condition. How much? How much was the bill I sent you? Twelve dollars. That pig ain't worth more than five. Well, maybe not right now, but he will be. Here, I brought you a bag of corn, too. Feed the corn to the pig, and in three months, Homer, you'll be owing me money. Now, but listen. hey, by the way, come to think of it, I believe you owe me money right now. Yep, here it is. Your bill for Mrs. Ramsey's appendicitis operation. Well, uh, uh, come into my office, John. I want to talk to you about that. Sure. Uh, take good care of that pig, Mr. Raymond. Sit down, John. Oh, thank you, Homer. John, that bill was sent to you by mistake. No offense, you know. Uh, now, let's see uh, what I owe you. Of course, I know you'd rather had Doc Robinson do that operation, Homer, but being as he was out of town and it was an emergency... Sure, sure. Uh, Guess you saved Martha's life that night, John. Well, it would have been a heap easier if we'd had a hospital in Westport. There's a lot of patients lost on kitchen tables. Still got that pipe dream about a hospital? You did all right on the kitchen table. Well, let's see the bad news. Here you are, Homer. A hundred dollars. That's right. How much of your time did that operation take? Oh, about four hours, I calculate. A hundred dollars for four hours. Huh, that's pretty steep, John. And you really mean that, don't you, Homer? You bet I do. Uh -huh. well, what do you pay your janitor here? Forty cents an hour. Uh -huh. Well, I guess I made a mistake in figuring the bill, Homer. Uh, that's more like it. Yeah, but the only place we differ is the value each of us put on your wife. I was a mite too high, so I'll settle right now for 40 cents an hour. Dollar 60 cents cash. Oh, now, John, I didn't mean that. <laughs> I'm perfectly willing to pay a fair, fair price. Give me a dollar and 60 cents. Well, I feel ashamed to settle for that, John. Really, you know why? Give me the money. Huh? Oh, sure. Here, here it is. Thanks. Now, I'll just make a notation on this bill. Settle for a dollar 60 cash. You got a bargain of that, Homer. You'd have had to pay a grave digger for six hours. There's the 
the record of the transaction, Homer. Settled for a dollar sixty cents. You got a real bargain that time, Homer. Let's get on with this, Clyde. I ain't got all day. Sure, sure. Uh, let's see. This next paper, well, it isn't a bill for a change. It's a newspaper announcement of Dick's graduation from medical school, June 17th, 1936. At Curtis University today, Richard Marvel Abbott, son of Dr. John Abbott, was graduated. That was a right fine speech you made, Dick. <laughs> Didn't understand all the big words, but you said them well. Thanks, Dad. I've never mentioned this before, Dad. I've always seemed kind of awkward, but thanks, Dad, for all these years here. Ah, oh, no, no, no. It's been my fun, Dick. Say, uh, I've been meaning to ask you, if you were going on into postgraduate work now, just what would you specialize in? Oh, that's easy. The thing you always wanted to do, neuropathology. And I'd like to know all about nerves. Ah, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Because you're going to spend the next two years at the Sorbonne in Paris. The Sorbonne? Oh, but you can't afford that, Dad. I've managed to save a little, and, and I've an idea where I can borrow some more. I'd be a liar if I told you I wasn't crazy to go, but... Yeah, you'll sail in two weeks. You know, son, to my way of thinking, neurology is the greatest field in the world. There's so much pain I could spare people if I knew how. Some diseases, well, I, I can't cure them at all. But if I could only take the pain out of them... I know, but, Dad, you always wanted postgraduate work. You never got it. Now, why should I? Oh, times have changed, Dick. Doctors have to know more these days. And, and what I don't know, well, <laughs> maybe when you come back, you, you teach me. So, you see, it's a big sort of partnership, you and me, eh, <laughs> son? Thanks, Dad. Dad, you're swell. Dad! Dad, wait! Where's Jean? What's all the yelling about, young lady? Dad! Howard Sykes wants to drive you back to Westport. May he? Howard Sykes? Well, I guess so. Oh, thanks, Dad. Oh, Dick, your, your speech was grand. Well, thanks. Dad, have you told him yet? Uh-huh, just now. Isn't it wonderful, Dick? I know you're going to be all kinds of a success over there. Well, Howard's waiting. Bye. Bye. You come home early. I will. Hey, uh, Dad, I don't know whether I like the idea of Jean running around with that Howard Sykes. No. Why, son? You, you haven't got anything against Howard Sykes, have you? No, no. Of course well, not. Neither have I. <laughs> not a thing. Except, of course, he's George Sykes' son. Yeah. <laughs> Dad? Huh? Dad, I want to talk to you about some of these bills. Oh, never mind those. Look here. Letter just come from Dick. The letter can wait. Dad, something's got to be done about getting in some of this money that's owing you. Look at this bill. It's five years old. To Eben Fisher, setting broken leg, $25. Received on account, $2.50, one bushel of turnips and four dozen eggs. Hey, good eggs, too. And here's one to Mrs. Sarah Bright. Removing cataract from right eye, $40. Received on account, two months laundry. Oh, Dad, these people ought to pay you. Oh, they do the best they can, honey. Most of these folks have a pretty hard time of it. But what about you? Trying to keep Dick in Paris and all. Oh, I'll get along all right. We'll manage somehow till Dick comes home. <laughs> then we'll have a real doctor in the family. But, Dad, that's another two years yet. In the meantime, what do we do with these bills? Well, we got to do something, huh? Well, I tell you, Jeannie, just mark them paid in full and we'll forget all about them. In just a few minutes, Mr. DeMille and our stars Lionel Barrymore, Anita Louise, and Glenn Ford will return in Act Two of A Man to Remember. Well, it's a pleasure to see our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins. Greetings, Libby. Busy as ever, I suppose. I should say so, Mr. Ruick. It keeps me busy keeping up with the stars. Lately, it takes me 24 hours a day sometimes. Well, it seems to agree with you, Libby. You look fine. Oh, I wouldn't have missed it, Mr. Ruick. Well, not long ago, I was out at the soldier's canteen where Mary Martin and Claudette Colbert served coffee and sandwiches at night. And Mary and Claudette had been busy all day long, but you should have seen them pitch in and help make sandwiches. I'll bet two such famous stars had plenty of customers for those sandwiches, Libby. <laughs> well, rather... 
And everyone agreed Mary and Claudette looked just as lovely working at that canteen counter as they look on the screen. Of course they did. Those girls have real beauty. Lovely, fresh complexions that pass the close-up test, both on the screen and off it. You know, it's nice to be able to say they use Lux toilet soap regularly. Uh, you mean you might say Mary and Claudette have Lux soap complexions? <laughs> I know they have. Well, here's what Claudette Colbert herself told me. Even if I'm all in at bedtime, she said, I never neglect my Lux soap facial. The Lux soap lather's so rich and creamy. Why, it feels as if you were smoothing beauty in. Well, Libby, many famous Hollywood stars depend on active lather facials with Lux toilet soap for a complexion care that really works. I wish you'd tell the ladies in our audience just how Mary Martin and Claudette Colbert take a Lux Soap Beauty Facial. Certainly, Mr. Ruick. First, you pat the smooth Lux Soap lather lightly in. Then you rinse with warm water and follow with cool. You pat to dry with a soft towel. Mm, it's wonderful how that creamy, active lather removes stale cosmetics and every trace of dust and dirt. And it's delightful how soft and smooth your skin feels after this beauty care. Yes, Libby, screen stars have found this care has a gentle way with delicate skin. Why don't you try these Lux Toilet Soap facials for 30 days? See what they can do for your skin. Get three cakes of this luxurious white soap tomorrow. You'll get a rich return in loveliness for a very small investment. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of A Man to Remember, starring Lionel Barrymore as Dr. Abbott, Anita Louise as Jean, and Glenn Ford as Dick. In the office on Main Street, Lawyer Perkins turns over the papers contained in old Doc Abbott's strongbox. The town's three leading businessmen watch eagerly as the attorney picks up the next item, another newspaper clipping, a landmark in the history of Westport. Hmm, looks as if the doc kept everything they printed about that hospital you built, George. <laughs> yes, certainly does. And the doc was always hepped on that hospital idea. Yes. Always wondered just how you came to build that hospital, George. Well, I felt I ought to do something for the town, Clyde, and that seemed a sort of a lasting thing. Sort of a monument, eh, George? Mm hmm Say, here's a funny thing, a dance card of Jean's. Some affair at the country club, September 1937. Seems to have been the time your boy Howard was going around with her, George. His name's here for most every dance. Uh, yes, yes. He did see quite a bit of her at one time. Didn't last, though. Yes, that's the way it is with young people. Everything's fine one moment, then they have a little quarrel and everything's off. Yes, it happened that night. They were driving home from the dance. Howard, don't you think I'd better drive? I'm just as sober as when I'm sober. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Howard, please slow down. Howard. Please. All right, I'll slow down. Oh, goodness, you nearly turned us over. Well, I didn't. Jeannie, do you know you're beautiful, Jeannie? Oh, Howard, please. I didn't mean I wanted to park. I think you'd better take me home. Sure I will, on one condition. What's that? Tell me you love me. Oh, don't be silly, Howard. Let's go. All right, then I'll, I'll kill myself. Howard, where'd you get that gun? Give it to me. Let go, let go. I'm going to kill myself. Howard, stop it. Give me that gun, you... <gasps> Jeannie, I, I didn't mean to. Honest, I didn't. Jeannie, where did it hit you? In, in my arm. Oh, by my handkerchief around it. Oh, gosh, Jeannie, I, I, I might have killed you. Now, lie as still as you can. And I'll, I'll get you right home to your father. Just lie still, Jeannie. Don't move. Just lie still, Jeannie. Please, don't move. George, come in. Where is he? Where is my son? He's gone home. You just missed him. Is he? Is he all right? Uh, yeah, he's all right. And Jeannie's all right, too, luckily. Just a shot in the shoulder. John, John, this, this, this is terrible. Yes, George, it is. Might have been murder. Or at the very least, manslaughter. But the boy didn't mean to hurt her. I know, George. And he feels pretty terrible about it. But, well, well that, I suppose, is a question for the jury to settle. You know, of course, I have to report any gunshot wound to the police. That's the law. Oh, but, John, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. Listen, John, I'll do anything to make it right. Will you, George? You name it. I'll do anything you say. George, you've made a lot of money around this town. I, I guess you're about the biggest man Westport's ever produced. Well, 
I was just thinking it's a shame that you won't leave any fitting memorial behind you. A man like you should engrave his name in the history of his town. Something big, George, you know? Something worthwhile. Like, like what? Like the George Sykes Memorial Hospital. You mean, you mean you want me to build a hospital? That's the idea, George. Well, I won't do it. Why, this is blackmail. Yes, sir, I guess it is. Well, it won't work. I won't build a hospital for you or anyone else. Not even for your son, George? Be a pity to see him go to jail. Now, wait. John, John, be reasonable. I'm willing to do anything within reason. That's the way to talk. Yes, sir, George, I'll bet it won't cost you more than thirty or forty thousand dollars. Thirty or forty? Oh. And maybe they'll even let you make a speech. Oh. Think of that, George, standing up in front of the new building with the crowd cheering and the band playing. <laughs> George, I'm proud of you. <laughs> from the man who made this building possible, the greatest humanitarian in our town, Mr. George Sykes. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Friends and fellow townspeople, in giving this handsome structure for the benefit of our sick, I, George Sykes, am doing very little when I glance back at this structure costing $40,000 plus landscaping, I do not feel proud, my friend. I feel very humble because I have been able to do some little act to make my presence in the community a thing of benefit to us all. I thank you. Good speech, eh, Doc? Short and to the point. Wonderful speech. I guess that makes George Sykes about the biggest man this town ever saw. And what a heart. What a heart. I think I'll go in and take a look around the building. I'd like to see what he's done inside. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. What can I do for you? Oh, afternoon, Superintendent. I just figured I'd better drop in and sign the doctor's registry. Well, you see, doctor, Mr. Sykes wanted to be sure that only the most modern methods were practiced here. And so uh, he made a proviso that only physicians who have had postgraduate work within the last 20 years would be admitted to the registry. Oh, I see. However, there was a provision made for you, Dr. Abbott. You will be allowed to use the charity ward. Provided, of course, a regular hospital physician stands by. Mm-hmm. Ah. <clears throat> Are there any other things that would bar a doctor out of here? Nothing but the 20-year clause. I just wondered, because my son's going to get back into town next week from Paris. I just wanted to be sure there wasn't any stipulation against all doctors named Abbott. <laughs> Gosh, the old place hasn't changed a bit, has it? Same old house, son. Dick. Oh, it's wonderful to see you again, Dick. Hello. Oh, Jean. Hey, you've changed. <laughs> Have I? <laughs> I told you, son. Well, I'll take your bag upstairs. Come on now, we've got a lot to talk about. Come on, Dick. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Well, what's the matter? Well, you... <laughs> well, you really surprised me, Jeannie. I mean, hey, you know, I didn't even kiss you. Well, it's... It's not too late, is it? No, I guess it isn't. <laughs> well, what's so funny? Oh, I don't know. Just, well, all the time I've been thinking of you as, as a sister. Yeah. And you're not at all, are you? Why, no. <laughs> I'm not. Sit down, sit down, sit down. I'm itching to hear what you've been doing. Did, did you study under Dr. Redding all the time? Mm -hmm, two years. Redding, great man. Yeah, he knows his stuff all right. Say, you know, Dad, I, I can't get over Jeannie. I, I, she's blossomed out into a regular beauty. You ought to come home oftener and check up on what's going on. Well, it's a surprise to me you're not married, Jeannie. Oh, I suppose you think I've never had a chance. Oh, I'll bet you have. <laughs> hey, what about Howard Sykes? Oh, I see Howard once in a while. Nothing serious, though. Oh, 
Redding. You know, I always hoped I could study with a man like Redding someday. Well, why don't you, Dad? Say, why don't you go over to the Sorbonne for a year? Okay. Me? In Paris? <laughs> nah. That's no place for a plug. Say, Dad, do you mind if Gene and I scoot off for a little while? I'd kind of look the old town over again. Why, no. No, 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 not at all. Go, go run along. I'll get a hat. Be back in a minute. Well, son, I, I guess I got to get a sign painter up here tomorrow. A sign painter? What for? I got to have the sign out there, Chains. Going to put your name first. Make it Richard Marvel Abbott, M.D. And under it, John Abbott. What do you think of that? Well... Dad, there's something I want to talk to you about. Huh? Go ahead, son. Well, about three months ago, I had a letter from Dr. Robinson here in town. He wanted me to go in with him as his partner. I wrote him I, I wouldn't do a thing, though, before I talked to you. Well, you, you want to go in with Robinson? Well, it's not much of a question of wanting to. It. Uh, well, forgive me, Dad, but I know the kind of patience you have. And, say, you know, I'll bet you're way in debt right now on my account. So if I go with Dr. Robinson, I'd make you some real money. Well, son, money's never bothered me much. But what I owe or what's owed me. <laughs> I guess that's the wrong attitude, though. Oh, Dad, I wish you'd understand it. It's not money for its own sake. It's just that it... Well, I'll be the only neurologist in this town. That's a new line, and people will go for it. There's people with money who can afford it. Well, what about the people who can't afford it? I'll make a deal with you, Dad. I'll take care of any case you send me for nothing. Huh? All right, son. Let's shake off. I'm ready, Dick. We won't be long, Dad. No, just take a look around, that's all. Goodbye, Dad. Goodbye. Goodbye, son. What's all the racket about? Hey, come on out, can't you, Jeannie? I want to show you my new car. Oh. So you have a new car? Uh -huh, sure. Well, what, what do you think of it, huh? Oh, it's very nice. Much better than anything your father ever had. Oh, now, don't be like that. Dad understands if you're going to succeed as a doctor, you've got to put on a little front. Your father never did. Then I... I suppose he isn't a success. Now, look, Jean, Dad knows exactly why I moved and why I went into partnership with Dr. Robinson. You evidently don't want to understand. After all he's done for us and what he's expecting from you, I'll never understand. Oh, now, please, Jean. Hey, come on, have dinner with me Thursday night and we can talk this out. Hmm? No. No, oh, now, why? I've been meaning to tell you for the past week, only So seldom we see you anymore. I'm going to be married. Oh. Howard Sykes? Yes. Okay. Congratulations. Good night. Good night. Gene? Gene? Come here, will you? Quickly. Dad, what's the matter with you? Ah, help me, will you? You sit up, will you? Oh, Dad, what is it? I, I thought you were asleep here on the couch. Oh, tell me what to do, please. Ah, uh, it's all right now. Gee, a little hard at that, eh? See, if you should ever find me like that again, Gene, always help me to sit up. So, uh, when you lie down... Uh, well, once in a while, it's the end. Oh, Dad. Dad. Why, Jeannie, you're crying. It's all right. I'm all right now, honey. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. But now, go, suppose you answer that door. It might be a patient. All right, Dad. <sighs> Good evening. Dr. Abbott in? Yes, he is. Can I see him? My name's Johnson. Just a moment, please. The man to see you, Dad. Hmm? Patient? I don't know. He, he said his name is Johnson. Johnson? All right, send him in. Will you come in, please? Oh, thank you. Good evening, Doc. You remember me, don't you? I guess I do. Don't go, Jean. What is it? Jean, this man is your father. My... My father. I guess maybe I ought to do a little explaining. Uh... I don't think it's necessary. I've told her already, long ago. Oh, I see. Well, I've got to run upstairs. Good night, Jeannie. Good night, Dad. And good night, Mr. Johnson. Well, what do you want? Oh, nothing, nothing at all. I just came back to 
well, to apologize for the way I was, Doc. And to thank you for taking care of my daughter. If you're thinking of taking her with you, it's no go. Oh, no, no, Doc, it ain't that. Since I gave her to you that night, I... I've been living in the eastern part of the state, and I've done pretty well, too. Well, well, I want to pay you for the trouble and expense you've gone to. Here, it ain't what I'd like to give you, but it is something. Three thousand dollars. Three thousand? Hey, you sure you can spare that? Oh, yes, yeah, i got plenty for myself, and, and I'm working steady. Well, i got to get along. I don't suppose I'll ever be able to tell you just how much this money means to me, Johnson. I, I'm going to take it because I need it. You're, you're a mighty fine man, Doctor. Good night. Jean! Jeannie! Yes, Dad. Has he gone? Yeah, yeah, Jean, listen. The, the, you remember we had an extra registration blank for the saw bun when we, we, Dick filled his out? Well, yes, but... Get it for me, will you? Hey, Jean, I'm going to fill out my application for a course under Dr. Eddy. Oh, Dad. <laughs> you want to hear from him in a couple of weeks, and, and then I'm going to Paris, Jeannie, and show him that an old fella can learn as well as a young one. Dad, that's marvelous. <laughs> Now, say, ah, that's the girl. Come on, ah. Ah. Once more now. Ah. ah. That's fine. Well, Doctor, it's just a sore throat and a cold, ain't it, Doctor? Well, the throat and the um, nasal passages are inflamed. You, you, you say the Hostetter boy's been sick, too? Yes, Doctor. And the Musicaro children? That's right, same symptoms. Hmm, well, uh, well, now, I tell you what I want you to do, Mrs. Smith. Keep Sally in the house and don't, under any circumstances, let other children come in. You mean it's something serious? Well, no, I can't say yet. I, I want to see the Hostetter boy and the Musicaro kids. <laughs> Meeting of the Board of Supervisors of the Town of Westport's in order. Uh, Dr. Abbott would like to say a few words. What about, I don't know. Oh, I won't take much of your time today, gentlemen, but I felt the Board of Supervisors ought to be told of a condition threatening our town. What's on your mind, John? Well, you're having a county fair in two weeks, and I've come here to ask you to cancel it. Cancel it? Are you crazy? What for? Well, unless my diagnoses are all wrong, we're in for an epidemic of infantile paralysis. And what gives you that idea, Doc? I have four patients who reveal all the preliminary symptoms. Only four? That's no epidemic. Just quarantine them. Four cases of infantile paralysis, gentlemen, are enough to start an epidemic. Now, just a moment, John. The merchants of this town have put up about $12,000 for the county fair. Are you suggesting that we throw away that money just because four of your patients might have infantile paralysis? That's right, George. Uh, nothing doing. Quarantine your patients, and that finishes it. All right. Now then I'll have to go to the newspaper. Joe, I want you to print this story. Print it? Now listen here, John. We can't scare our readers with every wild rumor that comes down the road. But this isn't a wild rumor, Joe. You can't prove it, can you? Ah, uh, all right. Then I want to buy an ad in tonight's edition. You mean advertise this paralysis scare? I'm afraid we couldn't, John. Well, how about printing me up some handbills? Same thing, sorry. You got a boy, haven't you, Joe Harkin? And you, George, you, you got a little girl. Jenkins, your kid's just the right age, too. The right age for what? For infantile paralysis. Only don't worry, gentlemen. I'm going to see they don't get it. Goodbye, gentlemen. I hope you sleep well tonight. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille and our stars Lionel Barrymore, Anita Louise, and Glenn Ford 
will return in Act Three of A Man to Remember. Now here's a question I'm sure everyone's been asked, and most people find hard to answer. It's this, what's your favorite flower? One says, Why, it seems to me lilacs are the loveliest flowers in the world. So delicate, so fragrant. And another. Yes, lilacs are lovely. But what about lilies of the valley? Ever sniff anything more delicious than a bouquet of those? Well, if there were just one flower I had to choose, I think it would be the rose. So lovely to look at, with such a delightful perfume. And that's the way it goes. But you'll notice the choice is usually a flower with fragrance. Everyone loves the delicate perfume of flowers, even though it's pretty hard to agree on a favorite. And that's why the makers of Lux Toilet Soap decided to combine many delicate fragrances in the costly Lux Soap perfume. No less than 34 different ingredients have been blended by a master perfumer to make the exclusive perfume of Lux Toilet Soap. It's an exquisite flower-like fragrance, distinctive and delightful, a haunting fragrance that clings lightly to the skin. Screen stars tell you they love this Lux Toilet Soap perfume. It's luxurious and expensive, yet, because so many million cakes of Lux Toilet Soap are sold, each one costs you but a trifle. And here's a little trick smart women have discovered. I buy half a dozen cakes of Lux Toilet Soap at a time and slip a few in my dresser drawer till I want to use them. The Lux Soap perfume makes a perfect sachet and leaves a lovely light fragrance on lingerie and handkerchief. Why don't you enjoy the luxury of this fine, fragrant white soap? Lux Toilet Soap costs so little. Get three cakes tomorrow. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. The curtain rises on the third act of A Man to Remember. Starring Lionel Barrymore, Anita Louise, and Glenn Ford. <laughs> little by little, the life of Dr. Abbott unfolds itself. As lawyer Perkins turns over the contents of the strong box, the men are silent now, each busy with his own thoughts. The lawyer speaks quietly. Well, here's the last of the bills, gentlemen, for the printing of circulars. He did get those paralysis notices printed up, Jode, even if you wouldn't do it. And there's another item here showing that he gave each kid who helped him ten cents to post the notices around town. Remember that morning, gentlemen? Quite some excitement, wasn't it? Oh, it's a notice. Doc Abbott wrote it. Warning! Infantile paralysis! Keep your children indoors and away from other children. Do not attend the county fair. I am undertaking a house-to-house -house canvas to administer a preventative spray to all children whose parents will permit it. If I do not get to your house, come to me in the evening. John Abbott, M.D. Infantile paralysis. Mary, Tommy, you come right in the house with him. We weren't home when you came oh, to the house. money, Doc, but Dr. I'll pay Robinson you is my doctor, but I couldn't get in touch with him today. All and right, folks. Now, if you just line up one by one, I'll take care of you in the living room. Get those sprays ready, will you, Jeannie? Well, Dad. Oh, hello, son. What brings you around? Dad, I came to talk to you. Well, I'm pretty busy right now, Dick, but it's all right if you, if you can talk fast. Well, can we be alone? I'll go, Dad. No, no, Jean, no. Jean's been my right hand and most of my heart for a long while, Dick. What's on your mind? Well, it's all about this paralysis scare. Now, if you're wrong, Dad, it'll reflect on every doctor in this town. People will lose confidence. Yeah. Well, maybe we doctors should value our reputations more than we do. Or take me. I run a 50-50 chance of being wrong. If I am wrong, people lose confidence. But if I'm right, why then I've saved life. Young bodies, muscles, and bones, grief and pain. So I think it's worth a gamble, Dick. Well, there's another thing, Dad. This business of spraying children, whether they're your patients or not, well, that's considered unethical. Huh. The County Medical Association is pretty well stirred up about it. That, you see, that's really why I came to, to warn you. Oh, the County Medical Association stirs up, are they? Well, now, isn't that too bad? Well, you tell them they should have been stirred up a week ago. They're too late. Now, get out, son. I'm tired and I got work to do. All right, Dad. 
Dad, he felt he had to do it. He was only trying to help you. I know. Oh, Jean, I never felt it before, but... Ah, uh, I'm an old man. Gentlemen, your attention, please. You've heard the charges of the Medical Association, Dr. Abbott. The county fair and the reputation of all of us has been put in jeopardy by what we must consider an unwarranted action on your part. Have you any defense to offer? Uh, no defense, Dr. Robinson. Then I have no cause but to put your suspension to a vote. Suspension? All right, go ahead. When you want to tell me the good news, you'll find me at home. Well, all in favor of suspension, vote aye. Aye. All opposed, no. No. Motion carried. I'm sorry, Dick. Now, just a minute. Because my father made a mistake, you voted him out. But let me tell you, the greatest men in medicine were those who made the greatest mistakes. That, that's how they learned and passed on their knowledge to us. What my father's done required more courage than there is in this whole room. With courage like his, we're doctors. Without it, we're, we're mechanics. Mr. Chairman, I have no choice but to tender my resignation. Dick, you can't do that. I'm sorry to be late, gentlemen. Oh, come in, Dr. Palmer. We waited for you as long as we could. Well, I'm sorry I couldn't get away. I have six cases of infantile paralysis in Wellington. What? Paralysis? Are you sure, Dr. Palmer? Of course I'm sure. We're in for an epidemic, gentlemen. There are eight cases reported in Palmdale, 14 in Riverdale, four in Delta, and it's spreading like wildfire. <clears throat> I assume we shall disregard all action in this meeting. Do I hear a motion that we insist on cancellation of the county fair? I make such a motion. All in favor, aye. Aye. There you are, Dad. There's the report from the whole county. They've licked the epidemic. Oh, isn't it wonderful? And it's all due to you. No, 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 not me. The doctors worked pretty hard, Jean. Oh, yes, but it's you who showed them the way. I'll go, Dad. Special delivery letter for Dr. Rabbit. Sign here. Oh, there. Dad, a special delivery from Paris. Huh? Paris? From the Sorbonne. Hey, read it to me, will you, Jeannie? Uh, my eyes are, they are kind of tired. <laughs> Don't be so nervous, Dad. Huh. Now, dear Dr. Abbott. Your application for admission to Dr. Redding's courses in neurology have been duly received. We regret to inform you that this class requires two years' graduate work from anyone entering. We are therefore... Yeah, yeah, that's enough, Jeannie, that's enough. Oh, Dad. Oh, it's not fair. Well, now maybe it's just as well. I got a better place for that money anyway. May I come in? Dick? Hello, Jean. Hello, Dad. Well, son, it's good to see you. Dad, there are, there are a lot of people outside. People? Uh -huh. Well, send them in. Well, I think maybe you'd better see them on the front porch. It's pretty much of a crowd. Crowd? To see me? Who are they? Well, the minister's leading them. Come on out here, Dad. <laughs> well, Dick, what's all this? Looks like everybody in town. Well, I guess it is, just about. Good evening, Doctor. Oh, good evening, Reverend. Dr. Abbott, you've been among us for a long time, and you've worked hard. You've never made much money, I guess, because the people you worked for didn't have much. But you didn't care. You just kept right on working. We wanted you to know we're... we're grateful. I have here a letter, a letter of thanks. It's got 6,000 signatures, Doctor. Every man, woman, and child in town. It's just to let you know that we, uh, uh, that we love you. Why, I... Uh, I believe I, Dr. Robinson has a few words to say. Dr. Abbott, I've come to extend my personal and professional apologies. You've taught us all something, not only about medicine, but about humanity. The Westport Medical Association has delegated me to inform you that, if you will accept it, 
you have in advance been elected president by acclamation. Hooray! Uh, Dr. Robinson and uh, friends, uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, oh, Dad, I'm I'm proud of you. <laughs> well, thanks, son. It's been something of a night, ain't it? <laughs> Come on, Dad. I'm going to put you on the couch, and you're going to rest. Yeah. Well, I <laughs> guess I am pretty tired. I'll take it. Hello? Yeah. Oh, yes? Yes, Mrs. Harmon. Dr. Abbott will be right over. It was Mrs. Harmon, Dad. She thinks Joe's broken his arm. I'll take the case. Oh, but, but, but she, she expects me. I told her Dr. Abbott would be right over. Oh. Well, thanks, son. Dad, would you mind if I get that sign painter up here tomorrow? Son, I... I, I like that fine. I won't be long. Dick, do you mind if I go with you? You see, I... I always go with Dr. Abbott on cases of this nature. Oh, I think that that's a great idea. Hey, I don't suppose I could hope that you'll always go with Dr. Abbott? Dick, if you want me. No, what about Howard Sykes? Oh, that was only because you were so stupid. I wouldn't marry anyone but a doctor. But I had to make sure he was a real doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think, I think maybe you got one, Jean. I think maybe, yeah. Uh... Well, I'll do my best. Come on. Goodbye, Dad. Goodbye, kid. Dr. Rabbit, be right over. This is so much. We regret to inform you. Huh. Six thousand names. Every man, woman, and child in the town. <laughs> Dr. Abbott, be right over. Calculations, I owe the three of you $2,526.37. In this envelope, you will find $3,000. After you've taken out what I owe you, there should be $473.63 left for Richard and Jean. Don't try to make it any less, because knowing you good people... I took the precaution to tell them exactly how much there was. Until I see you all in eternity, I am your humble servant, John Abbott, M.D. Well, that's that. He was a good man, paid every cent he owed. Oh, 3.30. I suppose the service is just about over by now. Kind of wish I'd have gone. I wish, I wish I had to. Today, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. 
forever. So ends the story of John Abbott, M.D. Throughout America, there are thousands of others like him, whose estates are measured not in money, but in memories of service to their fellow men. The beloved artist who played John Abbott tonight returns to our microphone now, Lionel Barrymore. And with him are Anita Louise and Glenn Ford. to be back with you, C.B. And one thing I'm sure of, Mr. Barrymore, is that every doctor in our audience got a thrill from your performance tonight. And you know, nowadays, we have a pretty good chance to follow their example of self-sacrifice. Yes, Glenn. These are times when everybody should be thinking of others. Those boys out there in Australia and all our outposts where the flag flies today. But thinking isn't enough. We must go into action. <laughs> you can trust C.B. to get action in the picture. <laughs> well, we all want to see that total eclipse of the rising sun. Well, buying war bonds will hurry it up. <laughs> It'll take an awful lot of them, though. Why, it costs a million dollars a day just to feed the army. I don't know how you can be so pretty, Anita, and carry figures like that in your head. <laughs> Ask her how much you get back in ten years from an $18.75 bond. Oh, well, that's easy. $25 and a warm feeling in your heart. Yes, and somewhere, perhaps it will mean life itself to some American boy. We know that 10% of our income, yours and mine and everybody's, 10% put into war bonds now, every payday, will save American lives. It will buy the fighting tools for our fighting men. 10% of everybody's income is the quota, and war bonds and stamps may be purchased from a bank, post office, Savings and Loan Association, theaters, investment broker, retail store, or newspaper carrier. Well, what's on the schedule for next week, Mr. DeMille? Oh, All before right. you tell us that, Mr. DeMille, I just want to say that I think that the Lux Radio Theater is doing a grand war job. We need plays like those you're giving us. And speaking for myself, at least, I can't get along without your product, Lux Soap. It's been my regular complexion care for a long time. You see... I think Lux Soap is, is a lucky soap. Uh -huh. You're living proof that Lux Soap is more than lucky, Anita. But about next week. Yes. Well, what's the play, C.B.? A real thriller, Lionel. The Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer aviation hit, Test Pilot. And our stars will be Robert Taylor, Rita Hayworth, and Robert Preston. <laughs> it's a drama of Men who risk their lives every day to make American planes better. The test pilot. Mix action, adventure, and romance at four or five hundred miles an hour. And you have test pilot here next week with three of your favorites. Robert Taylor, Rita Hayworth, and Robert Preston. Uh, things never stop happening in that place, E.B. Uh -huh. Well, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Don't forget... I have bond and save a life. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Robert Taylor, Rita Hayworth, and Robert Preston in Test Pilot. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Glenn Ford appeared through the courtesy of Columbia Pictures and will soon be seen in their production of The Eagles Fly High. Heard in tonight's play were Leo Cleary as Sykes, Harlan Briggs as Ramsey, Griff Barnett as Perkins, Charles Seal as Harkness, Francis X. Bushman as Dr. Robinson, Fred Mackay as Howard Sykes, Bruce Payne as Minister, and Warren Ash, Dwayne Thompson, Dick Elliott, Edward Marr, Victor Rodman, Dick Davis, Leon Ledoux, and Mary Lou Harrington. Tune in next Monday night to hear Robert Taylor, Rita Hayworth, and Robert Preston in Test Pilot. Our music was conducted by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>